What if you could take your audio anywhere you wanted without ever leaving your editing room? What if you could get a perfect reverb sound every time without ever touching a setting? Welcome to the world of impulse response. So what is impulse response? Well, at a basic level, it's a way of capturing the acoustic and tonal properties of an environment or piece of equipment. It works by sending an impulse into a room or through a piece of equipment and then recording the response you get. You can use the response to filter other audio to recreate the effect of that equipment or space. Pretty straightforward. Impulse response is quite popular to digitally model things like analog audio equipment and guitar cabinets, but it can also be used to capture a snapshot of an acoustic space in order to create incredibly authentic reverb, which is what we're going to focus on. So the first thing you need to capture an impulse response is an impulse. There's three common ways to create impulses. A loud transient sound like a balloon popping or a starter pistol, a pink noise signal, or a sine wave sweep across the audible frequency spectrum. Each method has its own advantages and disadvantages, which I'll come back to in a second. The second thing you need is a way to capture the response. To do this, you need a microphone of some sort, or ideally multiple microphones. It's important to note that the impulse you capture will take on the properties of the microphone setup you use, so it's very important to consider how you do it. Professionals will use everything from basic stereo pairs to binaural pairs to 5.1 surround arrays to ambisonic microphones. We'll talk about some of those recording methods in future videos, but for the sake of simplicity, we're going to stick with a stereo ortif pair using my Rode M5 microphones for this video. So back to creating an impulse. The easiest way is something like a balloon popping. It doesn't require any special equipment, so it's very convenient. I'll show you an incredibly portable IR capture kit using this method towards the end of this video. That said, there are several downsides to this technique. The first is that it's very hard to get a consistent level when popping a balloon. That means you'll have to do a bit of editing work to make the finished impulse response consistent with others you've captured. The second issue is that a balloon pop doesn't produce sound equally across the frequency spectrum. This means your finished impulse response won't be as accurate at very high or low frequencies. For dialogue, that might be fine, but if you want to use a response on something like bass or drums, it can sound very artificial. To solve that issue, audio engineers came up with the idea of using a pink noise signal from a loudspeaker to create the impulse, since pink noise covers the entire frequency spectrum equally. The downside is that, to create a proper impulse, you need the sound to stop very suddenly. Loudspeakers aren't very good at stopping suddenly, so the captured response includes not only the sound of the room, but also several milliseconds of the noise fading away. For this reason, pink noise impulses aren't very common. Instead, sine wave sweeps from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz are the most popular way of capturing high quality impulse responses. Now obviously, a sine wave sweep isn't an instantaneous event, which is why you need a tool called a deconvolver. Basically, you play back a sine wave sweep of a certain duration, say 10 seconds, and capture that in an environment. Your deconvolver then processes the capture and turns it into an instantaneous response. This process creates the most accurate and realistic impulse responses. The downside is that it's also the most complex, as it requires you to set up a playback device and a loudspeaker besides the capture device. Your playback and capture system also have to either be the same system or be synced to the same clock, otherwise you may get jitter. Another downside is that the frequency response of your loudspeaker becomes a part of the captured response. With impulse response, you're not capturing what it would sound like for a sound source to be in an environment. You're capturing what it would sound like to play a sound source through a loudspeaker in an environment and then capture it with your microphone. So obviously having more accurate loudspeakers and microphones will give you a more authentic result. Still, this method is far more accurate than using a balloon. Another advantage of a sine wave sweep is that it helps reject background noise. Since you're capturing everything in an environment, if someone opens a door while you're capturing the impulse, that will be recorded in the impulse response and you'll hear it anytime you use the response. Sine wave sweeps happen over a duration of time and can be very long. Some engineers use sweeps that are minutes or even hours long. The longer the better. This helps reject background noise, which lets you capture much cleaner responses, especially in environments with a lot of background noise like outdoors. Okay, now that we fully understand how impulse response works, let's utilize it in the real world. I'm going to capture some responses in my bathroom so we can compare different methods. First, I'm going to compare a balloon pop versus a sine wave sweep. Then I'm going to compare a sine wave sweep of two different durations with background noise present. 
In order to capture a sine wave sweep, we need one to play back. Most impulse response reverb plugins have a sine wave sweep generator. In this case, I'm going to utilize Reverb, which is a built-in utility in the Reaper DAW. Reverb lets us set how long we want the response to be, as well as the sample rate. The sample rate you select is very important as the recorded response has to be the same sample rate as the impulse. For now, I'm going to generate two responses, one that's 10 seconds long and another that's a minute long. Time to capture our responses. All right, so here we are. I've got my Mackie CR3 loudspeaker here set up in the bathtubs or shower so we can play our sine wave sweep. I've got my two Rode M5 small diaphragm condensers in an ordered pattern here. Both are running over here to my Behringer UMC404 HD interface, which is running at 96 kilohertz and 24 bits, which is a fairly typical format to capture impulse responses with. So that's what we're going to use. So I'm actually going to move this a little bit over here. Um, but first we're going to capture our balloon pop response. So I'm going to do that right next to where the loudspeaker is to get as comparable a result as possible. Um, and then we can do our sine wave sweep. So let's do our balloon pop. All right, here comes the balloon pop. All right, now let's capture our 10 second sine wave sweep. All right, now that we've got our two uh, initial impulse responses, I'm gonna switch over and we're going to record a 10 second and then a one minute long impulse response and we're going to compare um, how much background noise is in it. So I'm going to make a little bit of noise over here at the counter while it's recording, and then we'll see how present that is in our 10 second and our one minute sweep. All right, with that done, let's go back and let's edit our impulses and uh, see how they turned out. Okay, now that we're back to the box, let's edit our responses. To edit the balloon pop response, we simply need to edit the file to cut off the initial pop, so the remaining response is just the sound fading out. We can then trim off the very end, put a small fade to make sure the tail is clean, then save it as a WAV file, and we're done. For the sine wave sweep, we need to go back into Reverb, add the file, hit the deconvolve button, then we select the captured response, the initial sweep, and select a place to save the finished file, which again will just be a normal WAV file. Once we've saved the deconvolved file, we need to trim and add a fade, just like with our balloon response, and this is to remove any noise or aliasing artifacts. Now to utilize our impulse responses. Again, pretty much any impulse response reverb plugin can load custom created responses. I could use Reverb to do this, but instead I'm going to use Convology XT, which is a free multi-platform plugin. All you have to do is navigate to and load in your response. Convology gives you a few ways to tweak a captured response. You can make it longer or shorter, adjust the decay, add a pre-delay, or even alter the stereo width of the reverb. Other than that, you can treat it like a standard reverb plugin. For our examples, I'm going to leave the responses untouched and play back some source material through the plugin. I have a recording of me talking, uh, upright bass playing, and a recording of a drum kit. First, let's compare the quality of our balloon pop to our sine wave sweep. The balloon pop was really mid-heavy, so I did filter it with an EQ to make it brighter and more natural sounding. See whether you think A or B sounds better. Have you ever wondered how big YouTubers like Linus Tech Tips make professional looking charts and graphs for their videos? Well, I can't tell you, but I can tell you how I do it. Have you ever wondered how big YouTubers like Linus Tech Tips make professional looking charts and graphs for their videos? Well, I can't tell you, but I can tell you how I do it.
Alright, so A was our sine wave sweep and B was our balloon pop. Even with the filtering, the sine wave sweep still sounds far more natural and balanced. It really sounds like the audio was recorded in that bathroom. The balloon impulse is still usable, especially with the dialogue, but it's clearly inferior in this matchup. Now let's compare our 10 second sweep to our one minute sweep when we have background noise present. Have you ever wondered how big YouTubers like Linus Tech Tips make professional looking charts and graphs for their videos? Well, I can't tell you, but I can tell you how I do it. Have you ever wondered how big YouTubers like Linus Tech Tips make professional looking charts and graphs for their videos? Well, I can't tell you, but I can tell you how I do it. In that case, A was 10 seconds and B was a minute. Personally, I didn't really notice much of a difference between the two, so it appears 10 seconds is plenty long for most environments. For environments with more extreme background noise, you might still want a longer impulse. If you want to play with these impulses yourself, I posted a link to download all of them on my Twitter. Obviously though, if you want to utilize impulse response reverb, you have to have an impulse response. And lugging around a bunch of equipment to do that isn't very practical. Still, you can put together a basic IR survival kit without much effort. My kit has some balloons, a pin to pop them, and a Zoom H2N field recorder. With H2N, I can record high quality responses in stereo or even four channel surround. The best part is this kit takes up next to no space in a bag so you can always have it with you in the field. It only takes a couple minutes of time to capture a response with this kit and it can save you a ton of time when mixing. Even if you decide your captured response isn't high enough quality to mix with, you can use it as a reference while mixing with an algorithmic reverb plugin. If you want to experiment with impulse response but don't want to have to capture your own, Echo Thief and the Open Air Library are two great resources to download free impulses that others have captured. I'll link them in the description of this video. Overall, impulse response is a powerful tool and knowing how to utilize it can make you a great sound designer. But anyway, that is it for this video. If you like this video, if you learned something new and useful, hit that like button. If not, feel free to hit the dislike button. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those down in the comment section down below. As always, if you want to see more videos like this one, please hit that subscribe button.